Welcome in to another edition of Darkness Radio. It's a Wednesday. It is Supernatural News. And of course, that means only one thing. I got me a co-host today. And if I've got me a co-host, that means only one thing. Uh, that probably means I got my buddy Beer City Bruiser here with me. Hey, Bruiser, how you doing? Hey, Tim, you sure do got me. One more week. I one, love it. One more week, my friend. Uh, how did the, uh, the um, vestiges of Minnesota treat you? Uh, last uh, weekend. Minnesota was fun to visit again. It was good to see you live yeah, in person. <laughs> it was good to see you as well last weekend, my friend. We had a we had a good time. You got to uh, see my my uh, decrepit little studio here last weekend, and we got to tear it up a little bit. I did clean it um, after you, you little, left. Little little popcorn thingies, the styrofoam yeah, the, popcorn things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I sent Bruiser home with some equipment uh, last weekend. Um, but I tore apart my entire studio to find some stuff. So, uh, and there was a box that ha- had all these popcorn curly thingies in it, and uh, I got them all over the studio. So I eventually uh, did clean that up. Yeah. So you're gonna find them for the rest of your life. You know that, right? Yes, they're hidden <laughs> everywhere now. They're in like the walls and in in the ceiling now. I think, and yeah, I'll probably be finding those for the next decade. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much how that's going to go. Lots of stuff on tap for today's show. Uh, lots of good stories. We got ghosties. We got aliens. We got uh, spaceships falling into the moon. Actually, that's our first story today. Um, and, and much, much more today. Uh, chock-a-block full of stories and a movie review. I got a movie review for you here. You do? I do. I was I was trying to get... Uh, Bruiser didn't have a lot of time before he uh, did his underwater needlepoint thing here in the Twin Cities. Um, and yes, I did watch him do underwater needlepoint here uh, th- this past weekend. Your, your form was quite fine, I must say. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I, I did the best with what I could. I understand that. Um, your knit one pearl two was on point. Thank you. And uh, you had a mean... Like- the new swirl I threw in there. Yes, you. Yep, you had yeah. a mean one of those, and uh, I noticed that your sit on the bottom of the pool has. I said sit. Yes. Um, on the bottom of the pool, you don't want to do the other thing because the lifeguard will blow the whistle on you, and uh, assign you a penalty. Um, but you, 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 you have a certain style, a certain flair that you do that with. Woo! Um, and uh, it, it, it came in handy. Yeah, it did. It, it helps me move a lot faster while I'm underneath there. So mm-hmm. I'm able to get the stitches in quickly because, you know, it's all about speed. It is. You know? Yeah. Speed is, is top priority when you're underwater needle pointing. So, yes. yeah. yeah. So the new form worked stupendous. Speed, flare, and panache, my friend. You had that going on for you uh, with the underwater needle pointing uh, this past weekend here in the Minneapolis area. So looking forward to seeing you the next time you're uh, – in town for the professional professional underwater needle pointing. I'll get that out. Uh, that's what she said. Uh, anyways, so <laughs> I do have uh, I do have a movie review. Anyways, I was what I was the long thing I was trying to say there. That's another. That's what she said. Um, the the long point I was trying to make here is that I had the opportunity to see the Foo Fighters new movie Studio Six Six Six. I had it on a screener. I was trying to see if I could. Uh, coax uh, uh, Bruiser into watching it with me, but he, unfortunately, we ran short on time. Yep, packing up all that stuff, we didn't have enough time to watch it. So, how was it? Like, is it? I've heard nothing but well, obviously, I've heard them from Dave Grohl, but yeah. uh, they're good reviews. So, what? Do you yes, what, Tim Dennis review of this. Oh, Timmy like Timmy like. You know, yeah. I I've, I've been a Foo Fighters fan for quite a long time, so I tried to put fandom aside on this deal, uh, and I tried to go into it with fresh eyes and just try to look at it from a kind of horror comedy type, you know, deal. But honestly, it's a, it's a little tough to put that aside because uh, the storyline really does deal with it from a Foo Fighters storyline. I was going to say, they are the Foo Fighters in the movie, correct? Yes, they are. They are. Um, and and then really, it's a simple storyline, but it in it it's it's a little i don't want to say complex but but it's funny it's it's kind of a funny deal and and the foo fighters have already made their 10th album but we're kind of going back in time a little bit and the gist of the movie is that they're documenting their the making of their 10th album and you know a lot of bands will go away when they're coming up with a a special album they'll go away and they'll record at a house 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the best example would be um, Led Zeppelin going okay. away to Bullskin House and, and recording. Uh, okay. You know, uh, uh, what the name's escaping me. I just said the name of the house and I can't think. Anton LaVey, Anton LaVey's house. And, uh, and recording from there, capturing the energy and, and uh, using the energy of the house to re- make a, a great recording. So they get that idea for their 10th recording. Well, it, it just so happens that when the Foo Fighters go away to record, Dave Grohl has got a little bit of, of uh, writer's block. Of course, it happens. You're right. And, and the rest of the group has got a little bit of uh, writer's block as well. So it, it, it's, it picks up from there. And uh, the, the group finds this, this house that's got kind of creepy energy. Okay. Okay. Well, it turns out that there's uh, a bit of um, a little bit of uh, the occult that's tied to this house. Oh, okay. And that's that makes where, it interesting. Yeah, that's where we begin with the movie, and uh, all heck kind of breaks loose from there. And there's actually some some other uh, some other actors and comedians involved in this movie that really rounds out the movie and makes it really good. Whitney Cummings is in this movie. Oh, she's great. Uh, yeah, and Will Forte is in this movie. He has a really funny uh, role in, in cameo in this movie as well. Another good one. Another good one. Um, so, essentially, that's where we're at with the with the film. In that, uh, the the gang gets together. They they're in this house. They feel a little bit of weird energy, and as the film goes along, you learn that it's got some. The house has got some ties to the occult and some weird things start happening and just off the house there's a room that's got some weird things in it that dave runs across and uh hijinks ensues we'll put it that way so we don't spoil anything for anybody there who's wanting to watch the movie i was impressed with this bruiser I'll, i'll give it this um when when you hear about the movie you hear that it's got the it's got the two magic words that may throw some people off. One is horror, one is comedy. Generally, you don't think the two mix. Um, I'll, uh, there's some really good horror comedies out there, though. There are, there are. Um, scary Movie, the original one, yeah. uh, is one that did it very well. Um, there are some out there that didn't do it so well. Uh, I trust Dave Grohl and I trust the Foo Fighters because I do like their sense of humor. I found this one to be really, really good. I liked, I liked the fact that they balanced it out very well, and I found there to be more, more of a serious tone to it with just hints of comedy, which is, which is the way I liked it. Um, okay. So they didn't go over the top comedy. They no, no, they no, knew no. what they were doing. Yes, they did, and it was kind of a wink and a nod type of deal. Yeah. Um, so I liked it. I, I really enjoyed this movie. I really did. Um, and, you know, we, we go on a scale of five stars here and, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to put it in the, I'll put it in the horror genre, not in a general genre, but in the horror genre. Okay. Um, believe it or not, I'll give it a three and three quarter stars out of five. I really liked it. That's actually a pretty good rating. It is. I, I enjoyed it quite a yeah. bit. Oh. And, and you know, you don't have to be a Foo Fighters fan to enjoy or even know the Foo Fighters catalog to how how were they as it. actors now I know Dave Grohl is acting obviously he's got mm-hmm. hilarious commercials but how about the rest were they do they look are they look like musicians trying to be actors or they actually look like they were doing something they're very comfortable they're they're, oh. they're really just kind of playing themselves okay yeah <laughs> which, which is hard. yeah it, which you would think well that 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 can't be too tough but it's tougher than you think to actually yeah. get on film and play yourself. Oh yeah, no, yeah. I know. <laughs> so yeah, it it uh, they they actually were they looked comfortable on on film, and uh, believe it or not, you know who's who's he's kind of a quirky guy in person, and his quirkiness comes off in this movie as Pat Smear. He's um he's really uh, kind of a different quirky kind of guy, and very funny in in real life. And he brings that quirkiness and that funniness to this movie. So um, he was he was really uh, and and for those people who don't know and aren't familiar with Foo Fighters, Pat Smear was actually in Nirvana in in originally in Nirvana and one of the original members of Nirvana that came over 
to Foo Fighters with Dave Grohl. Um, he was the original drummer, I believe, right? Uh, no, no, no. Dave Grohl was the original drummer in Nirvana. Uh, Pat Smear was a, a second guitarist. Okay. Yeah, so he came over to uh, Foo Fighters. Um, and Pat Pat is kind of, uh, the way Dave Grohl described Pat Smear in Nirvana is he was kind of uh, the guy who, when you needed uh, a rhythm guitar piece or a guy who was kind of a glue in the background that nobody would see, it, yeah. he was that guy. And he really is in this movie that same guy. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's he's one that even though even though he doesn't have a prominent prominent part in this movie, he's right there when you need that that perfect timing, or, you know, comedic timing or that perfect piece in the movie. He's just right there. So you need those type of guys too, you know, like. Um if you think about it, Boba Fett wasn't a huge thing in the original Star Wars franchise. Right. But because they did so well with placing that character in certain spots, became cult legend. Maybe this is Pat, Pat's, or Pat, right? Yeah. Yeah, Pat Smear. Yep. Maybe it's his uh, breakout moment as far as, because like I said, Dave Grohl's obviously acting. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe this is his breakout where people notice. I mean, you noticed it. So maybe everybody notices it. And this could be like, a new path for him. I think actually people are going to, are going to get to know the band in general. I, I think, you know, it's really when the, you think of Foo Fighters, you think of Dave Grohl and Taylor Hawkins, the the drummer. And then yeah. Pat, Pat Smears kind of the third that you think of, but I think everybody's going to get to know the band all the way around because all of their personalities really shine in this movie. Um, so I, I think this is a good kind of coming out piece for the entire band. It's kind of, uh, you know, the meet the Beatles of, 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 uh, of the, um, Foo Fighters. So, okay. Yeah. I like, see, yeah, that's cool. That's, I like when they do stuff, when bands open themselves up, yeah. you know, and yeah. you get to actually know them. Yeah. So it, it's a, it's a very good movie. I, I highly encourage you to check it out. Not just at a matinee, go see it on a, on a regular screening and uh, go support the movie. It's a it's a it's a good movie. I think uh, I think you guys will enjoy it, especially just for the the horror t uh, part of it. It's a it's kind of one of those good old fashioned uh, uh, slasher flicks too. So see those <laughs> like and those I love those. Those have a special place in my heart. Mm -hmm. Slasher flicks will always be around. I think. Oh yeah, yeah, and it, it's not as uh, prominent as the '80s, but you know, it has that. It does have that kind of 80s feel to it the 80s okay. slasher flick so yeah you'll you'll enjoy it you guys will enjoy it i think you will uh well let's uh let's mosey on over to uh supernatural news shall we all right we'll start out with this first story and it's our audio daily double for well yeah our one audio daily double for today it turns out bruiser that um uh we're launching rockets at the moon it's not us but there are there are rockets being launched at the moon, uh, just willy nilly, I guess. Just they're bored. Hey, we got a rocket. Yeah, we I got had, a moon. Let's just launch it. it. We're we're throwing space junk at the moon. Let's get this uh, this uh, story from MSN here uh, momentarily of man-made space debris that appears to be a rocket, and it's about to crash into Earth's natural satellite, the Moon. It was originally thought to be a piece of a SpaceX rocket from seven years ago, sort of somehow miraculously drifting all the way to the Moon somehow. Experts now say they believe it actually came from one of China's lunar exploration launch vehicles, but the plot thickens. Beijing denies it, saying that the booster in question had, quote, safely entered the Earth's atmosphere and was completely incinerated, adding their space administration conscientiously upholds the long-term sustainability of activity Activities in outer space. China is now forging ahead with its own space exploration, building a private Chinese space station with hopes of landing on the moon in just a few years. So who owns that object that is supposed to hit the dark side of the moon on March 4th? I guess that remains a mystery. Ooh, a mystery. He used all the, uh, the, uh, go-to words, the satellite of the earth, the natural satellite of the earth, the moon. The, it's gonna land on the dark side of the moon. Like <laughs> he, he knew his buzzwords. There's all the titillating words you could possibly uh, deal with in one little shot. There, that's for sure. I'm curious though if if Beijing did launch it, why are they saying no? Like, is it against the law to shoot it? Because isn't the isn't the space considered like 
international waters type thing like it is no jurisdiction out there right i was i was talking to a friend of mine recently you can't just um according to international treaties you just can't throw space junk out into space (laughs) so there's no littering in space that's right there's no littering in space Uh, and and you may think it's kind of weird but there's a reason for that um and a lot of it has to do with uh the scientific properties of throwing junk out into space. It's, it's uh, you know, unlike in the ocean, when you throw stuff out in the ocean, it just kind of floats and kills animals. Yeah. I, know, I know this is going to sound kind of, <laughs> kind of egregious. Um, when you throw stuff out into space, it forever floats and can damage other things. Not like things don't in the ocean, but it, it has 10 times the impact out in space. So I'll give you an example, Okay. Let's say we, we uh, in this, this rocket, for example, could have done a ton of damage to our satellites and other satellites that are in that orbit around Earth. Okay. So when you just willy-nilly launch a rocket out into space, if it hits one satellite and blows up a satellite, that blown-up satellite can then start to rip through other satellites in that ring around the Earth. So, so a ripple effect. A ripple effect, exactly. You got it, my friend. So you not only just blow up one satellite, you then start to shred other satellites around us. So that's communications, that's you know, telephone systems, that's you know, direct TV, that's whoever. It, it's also military satellites, it's also other satellites that are up there in the, in that ring. Yeah. And you start to deal with other countries' satellites as well, not just the United States that's up there. It's also Russia, it's China, it's Norway, it's Sweden, it's whoever else is up there in that ring of satellites that's around the Earth. And that so, can be viewed as an act of war, I do believe. That's exactly right. You got it. So, yep. so whoever throws that space junk up into international territory – it can be looked at as an act of war. You just hit it right on the head. So that's why you don't just throw stuff into space, unlike just throwing stuff in the ocean, where it's, you know, it's just throwing stuff into the ocean. Now I see why they denied it. Because now that yep. they, they're already in a lot of hot water with the world. They're like, we're good. Wasn't us. Sorry. <laughs> yep. So now, now you get it. Now you get why. You don't uh, you don't just uh, raise your hand and go, oh, yeah, we threw it in there. No big deal. Don't get, you know, your your panties in a wad over it, Um, because as a nation, you you uh, you're raising your hand over some stuff that could be potentially uh, uh, a huge violation between nations. Yeah. And like I said, that that definitely could be an act of war. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, We move on. Uh, There's a moment here where a terrified ghost hunter is strangled by an evil spirit inside the haunted home of an 80s pop icon, Toya Wilcox, in a paranormal reality show. Uh, This is overseas, by the way. Okay. I don't remember a Toya Wilcox in the 80s, and believe me, I lived through the 80s. (laughs) Uh, the moment a paranormal expert was allegedly strangled by an evil spirit inside the home of 80s icon Toya Wilcox was captured on a new paranormal reality show in scenes filmed for Discovery Plus's original series Celebrity Help My House is Haunted. Paranormal expert Barry Guy uh, was seen choking and gasping for air when confronted by an aggressive ghost called George. Doesn't sound like an aggressive name. No, it doesn't. I was expecting something more like menacing, <laughs> you know, like a Victor, but a George. <laughs> yeah, and, well, gorgeous George was quite the aggressive guy. Back That's in, true. Back in but the day. Yeah. If you looked at how he dressed and he came out with the perfume. I don't know. Well, true, true. Uh, the 63 year old pop star Toya appeared on the show after becoming convinced her Worcestershire home is haunted by various ghosts, some of which are evil evil i say uh after being called to investigate wilcox's home the team discovered an agitated male energy in the attic and heard an ominous growl on barry's recording voice or or, on recording device not recording voice they heard a voice on the recording device i'll get that straight eventually uh suddenly the audio began picking up snippets of the spirit mentioning barry by name and telling the team to get down you mean like get 
down. I was going to say, like, they wanted to boogie because I know it was a pop star. Get down. Uh, Yeah, I think so. Uh, As Barry questioned or continued to question the spirit, he suddenly brought his hand to his throat and began coughing and gasping for air. After fellow ghost hunter Ian Lawman uh, asked what was happening, a panicked Barry rushed downstairs claiming F and hell, something just grabbed my windpipe. Downstairs, visibly shaken, Barry was comforted or comforted by Ian, admitting effing scared the the shit out of me, is what he said. I, I can't continue not to swear when he's got some good swear words there. Uh, <laughs> something just grabbed my windpipe. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't get a breath in. That's what scared me. I thought I was going to die, Barry said. Uh, having gathered himself, Barry admitted that the choking incident, as well as the team's other findings, confirmed Toya's home was haunted, saying... That, to me, is validation. Uh, We have clear, intelligent responses telling me that we need to help them. Jane Harris agreed. I think there is one malicious spirit here in this house that we need to release so that they can go and find peace. Uh, Having lived in the house for over 20 years, Toya claimed that she and various friends had witnessed paranormal activity on multiple occasions. This house is absolutely extraordinary. It is a very active house, she said. I suppose I I just want proof. I just want to know it's not just me. Uh, The actress Rula Lenska visited us, and she was down in the cellar, and she could hear children screaming, and she passed out. Well, that's not pleasant at all. No, it's not. No. Uh, When she came around, she said she was surrounded by children with multiple active rooms on the property. Uh, Toya was keen to rid the house of any evil that lingers there. The majority of the spirits I really, really like, she went went on to say, and if they feel they are in the right place at the right time, then they're welcome, she said. If they're really evil, pardon my language here, she says they can fuck off. <laughs> you, you're cool. You're cool. F you. You're cool. You're cool. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Uh, with no prior knowledge of the property or its occupier, medium Ian entered the house to conduct his initial investigation, claiming he sensed the presence of ghosts straight away. Walking through the house, Ian noticed a coat hanger drop to the floor saying, I think that somebody is trying to get my attention. The further I get up the stairs, I can hear laughter. Elsewhere, Barry met with Mark, Toya's friend and hairstylist. Uh, Mark, uh, w- they, they wrote this twice. Elsewhere, Barry met with Mark, Toya's friend and hairstylist, Mark, to find out, <laughs> Mark, 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 uh, to find <laughs> out. It, what's his name? His Mark? name's Mark. Mark, okay. Mark, 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 Mark. 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 Uh, to find out what he's experienced inside the house, there was an experience where we all went up into the loft and I got this tremendous heavy feeling and this feeling of sick, said Mark, 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 Mark. Uh, and then I started to sort of shake and it turns out that there was a spirit up there that needed releasing uh, that was trying to come through my body. He needed a release, Bruiser. Yeah. Sometimes they just need a release. That's true. They all do sometimes. Yes, sir. Uh, In the cellar, Toya closed her eyes and tried to make contact with a male ghost, saying, the first thing I'm seeing is a woman with two children. She then described a gentleman who had been haunting the lower floors of her home, saying, I've had to push him away. He put his hands around my throat uh, as we started. Can I show you what he wanted to do? This is weird. Okay. Can I show you what he wanted me to do to you? She, uh, she said before she suddenly was started hissing at Ian and the team. He's really effing angry, she went on to say. After describing the spirit as a bearded, unclean man, Toya said the ghost's name was George and that he had been a soldier he fought or who fought in the English Civil War. Uh, with the investigation shaping up to be one of the team's most active cases yet, Toya left Ian, Barry, and Jane for the night as they rigged the house with fixed cameras. As a result of their findings, the team cleansed the house before revealing the results of the ghost hunt to Toya. We went into the attic and things took a darker turn, Jane said, before Barry interjected, saying there was an energy in that room. A lot of the responses that were heard related to me saying my name repeatedly as if I was being picked on. It says, I was sat there, I was talking, 
And all of a sudden, my windpipe was restricted. There was a lot of I was in that sentence. Uh, <laughs> I was, I tell you, I was. I was, I was, I was. I couldn't breathe. I was actually really scared. That makes me feel really emotionally. No, no. it makes me feel really emotional listening to it. Uh, that is the most scared I've been in 20 years. I thought I was going to collapse and die is what uh, they went on to say. So there you go. That that's still a terrifying experience. I'm just being touched in general. Yeah, this but, is an experience I can't imagine gasping for your life. You know, like just losing your breath feels. You know, like when you get the wind knocked out of you. Mm-hmm. That, that's like one of the worst feelings in the world because you just you can't think past the second, the next second. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's coming from out of nowhere. Yeah, but then uh, being choked afterwards is is quite the. Uh... Quite the experience. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not uh, not something I'd be very comfortable with. Actually, choking is one of the worst sensations to me. Choking and losing your breath or drowning. I'm right on board with you. I have a fear of all of those. Yeah. I, it not not a good deal. Not a not a good deal at all. Um, trying to get to this story here. Uh, this next story. I was sent the story uh, from one of our listeners. By the way, if you have a story that you'd like to uh, submit for Supernatural News and have us read here on air, you can do so by sending it to me, Tim at DarknessRadio.com. Once again, Tim at DarknessRadio.com, and we'd be glad to read that story here on air. You know what? We'll just go to a different story here because that one doesn't seem to be cooperating with us so we'll go on to a different uh spirit story actually we'll continue with the ghost theme this one's about the strange tale of a spirit photographer uh tales of paranormal phenomena i I can hit this button now can i i can just uh, go like this phenomena there you go uh tales of paranormal phenomena and strangeness have been with us for centuries And there's always been the desire to try and document them with whatever technology is at hand. For a long time, there were only written accounts, but then came the era of photography. And this opened up a whole new and exciting avenue for capturing evidence of the world beyond what we know. And in the era of spiritualism, in which there was widespread belief in communing with the spirit world, there came a wealth of people taking spirit photographs during seances and medium demonstrations. Although many of these were obvious fakes and attempts to pull off hoaxes, some seem to have taken this very seriously. One of them, or one of these actually, was perhaps the first to try and photographically document supernatural phenomena, (laughs) there's that word again, under uh, controlled conditions, leading to a collection of very surreal and bizarre pictures. In the 1940s, a popular and well-known Danish photographer by the name of Sven Turk uh, had developed an interest in spiritualism, which at the time was all the rage. Uh, This was an era in which spirit mediums channeling the dead and spooky seances in darkened rooms was a popular pursuit. At the time, he was a sort of national icon in the world of photography, having taken more than 50,000 images of various aspects of Danish life. Many of these, which reside at the Royal Library, uh, so he was no kook, uh, no kook, it says here, just curious, uh, he began attending various seances, and at, the, at first, uh, he went into it a bit skeptical, but open-minded. And after a time, he began to formulate the idea of trying to use his photographic skills to try and capture some of the strange phenomena that he claimed to have witnessed. So, would it says here, so would begin a strange series of experiments and a photographic odyssey that represents one of the more thorough and unusual attempts to document these seances and capture photographic evidence and parano- or rather of p- paranormal phenomena during the spiritual or spiritualist era. I don't know why this story is giving me so many problems <laughs> here. Uh, it's the last one because they kept repeating themselves. I guess Turk devised a rig composed of three infrared sensitive cameras designed to be at different angles in such a way so that one always showed the action from behind, one from underneath, and one from above. Sounds like he had all the angles covered there. (laughs) That's That's for sure. That's a party right there. 
Uh, he then went about trying to create a controlled environment so that the experiment would be as accurate as possible and to eliminate the possibility of trickery. With this done, he gathered a group of spirit mediums and people who claimed to have the power of psychokinesis, which is the alleged ability to move objects with one's mind, and set up his rig to see what would happen, if anything. Uh, if his accounts and subsequent photographs were to be believed, that would be quite a lot. Uh, during these sessions, Turk reported a wide range of unexplained phenomenon. Uh, chairs and objects would move and levitate. Uh, things would be knocked off of tables. A large work table rose up on one leg and began to whirl around its own base, spinning faster and faster. And on one occasion, a large dresser, so heavy that two men could not lift it without great effort, was moved out into the middle of the floor by some unseen force. Considering that this was being done on its own, or in his own controlled laboratory in Copenhagen, uh, there was judged to be very little chance of trickery or sleight of hand, and no cause could be found for the mysterious movements of these objects over several months. Or, or, no control, or no, <laughs> let me try that again. And no cause could be found for the mysterious movements of these objects, period. There you go. Over several months, Turk could be, or would dutifully uh, record as many of these instances on camera as possible, compiling quite the bizarre array of photos covering a, a wide variety of uh, paranormal weirdness. Uh, besides moving or levitating objects such as chairs and other furniture, there are quite a few odd ones uh, within the collection. There are several photos of the medium Borg Michelson, uh, or Borgia Michelson, rather, in which he appears to be floating through the air, including one in which a person on the floor seems to be trying to hold him or pull him down. In another series of shots, a medium is seen exuding a substance called ectoplasm, which is said to be a sort of material left behind by spiritual forces. And in one... And in one of them, uh, the face of what seems to be a spirit can be seen in the slimy substance. There's also shots of pieces of furniture lifting into the air with people on them or trying to push them back down to earth. The whole collection is a smorgasbord of strangeness, an impressive selection of clear photos of the paranormal, uh, the negatives of which allegedly were examined by some of Denmark's top photographic er, analysts, uh, including director of the Danish photographic school Theodore Anderson, with one, or none of them finding any evidence of trickery or manipulation. In 1945, Turk would compile all of these various photos into a book called Yegvardus Med and Dern, which. <laughs> okay. Yep, Yegvardus Med and Dern. Wonder if I can get that in my library. <laughs> I bet you can if you find it in the card catalog, uh, which translates to "I was familiar with the spirits," and the photographs were a sensation uh, within the world of spiritualism and paranormal research. Of course, the photographs have also been heavily criticized by skeptics for a number of reasons. Uh, many of the photographs seem staged, of course. In particular, those which feature levitating objects often show blur as if they've been simply tossed up and photographed in midair, and the ones of Michelson's levitation look as if they may have simply been taken as he was jumping or, jumping or being thrown. Uh, there's also the fact that even at the time these were taken, ectoplasm had been widely debunked as a frequent trick used by fakers, yet such photos have a prominent place in Turk's collection. There are a few of the photos that seem to be genuinely unexplainable, but these two are thought to have been fake somehow, despite the assurance from photographic experts at the time that these photos were authentic. The consensus among uh, skeptics seems to be that they were all staged with Turk either being duped by charlatans or having been in on it himself. Uh, you can see some of the photos. If you go to mysteriousuniverse.org. And decide for yourself. Uh, the photographs he took have been discussed and debated to this day with both skeptics and those who think uh, that he just might have been, he might have captured something truly special on film. Uh, if they are real, the images would rank among some of the clearest ever taken, shed, shedding light on a field 
where such photographs are hard to come by. However, this is an area that has long been plagued by hoaxers and fakes to the point that no photographic evidence, no matter how good, is going to stand up as proof of anything. Whether any of these were real or not, they are certainly a curious collection and a strange historical oddity that likely will invite discussion for quite some time. So there you go. I'm a big fan of spirit photography and and stuff like that. I know it can be hoaxed and I know all that, but I like those ones where they'll show a a medium or whatever during a seance and they do the energy pictures. Have you seen those like with the thermal cameras or just the the different can you see all the, I guess the aura all around them and stuff. Like I'm a huge fan of those. I think that's awesome to see. Yeah, they are. They're quite intriguing photos. That's for sure. Even if, even if they are manufactured, they're, they're fun to look at. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Our next story, uh, Bruiser, is uh, a little alarming, but kind of cool. Kind of cool. Scientists have made a breakthrough in warping time on the smallest scale ever. Okay. Yeah. Time travel, huh? A a little bit, but you you can do it at the uh, at the uh, size of a pencil tip. (laughs) I don't know that that increases my confidence at all, but uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, scientists were able to measure time dilation at a distance of just a millimeter or about the width of a pencil tip. Albert, Albert Einstein's theory of general rel- relativity is uh, packed with weird insights about our reality, but perhaps the most mind boggling is the fact that strong gravitational fields or incredibly high speeds can warp the passage of time, an effect known as time dilation. For instance, clocks located, I said clocks, bruiser, clocks. (laughs) I know my reading hasn't been up to snuff today, but that is clocks. Uh, Located on board. What's that? With an L. With an L. uh, Located on board spacecraft might tick slightly faster or slower than those on Earth, depending on the distortive effect of their velocities and our planet's gravity on time. Now, in a major breakthrough, scientists at JILA, a joint operation between the National Institutes of Standards and Technology and the University of Colorado Boulder, have measured time dilation at the smallest scale ever using the most accurate clocks in the world. The team showed that clocks, clocks... How do we know they're the most accurate clocks in the world? (laughs) That's a good question. That's fair. I, I I don't know. It says so in the article, so I says so to you. Okie dokie. Yep. Uh, <laughs> now I've lost my place. Most uh, accurate yes, clocks in the world. The most accurate know. clocks in the world. Uh, the team showed that clocks located just a millimeter apart, about the width of a pencil tip, showed slightly different times due to the influence of Earth's gravity. The new experiment paves the way towards clocks with 50 times the precision of those available today, which could be used for a host of practical applications while also shedding light on fundamental mysteries about our universe, including the long-sought union of general relativity and quantum mechanics, according to a study published on Wednesday in in Nature. Uh, When you go to such a small scale, what does that mean? Well, it means that the clock precision is better said Jun Yi, a uh, Gila physicist who co-authored the study in a call. In some sense, what we're trying to say is that time and space are interconnected. As Einstein's relativity told us, time is space, space is time, and time is relative. Did you get all that? I got that. All right. Uh, There's there's no absolute concept of time, is what uh, Jun Yi is saying. Uh, Yi and his Colleagues at Gila uh, have been pushing the frontiers of timekeeping and general relativity for several years by designing ever more accurate atomic clocks. The role of the pendulum in these clocks is played by the shifting frequency of electrons and atoms that are carefully arrayed in lattices designed to control their chaotic energy and motion. These innovations distinguish atomic clocks as being by far the most accurate timekeepers ever devised. There you go. That answers your question, Bruiser. (laughs) Capable of losing just one second over 15 billion years. Take that, Timex. 
Yeah. Yeah. Takes uh, a lick and keeps on ticking. Oh, yeah, look at these guys. 15 yep. billion years. Yes, sir. Uh, which is why they are used on global positioning service or GPS satellites and other systems that require hyper precise time. So there you go. That uh, that's that's your story there. They've so made... if I'm ever late for an underwater needle point event, I can just blame Earth's gravity. Yes. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> that's exactly it. The JILA um, said it was Earth's gravity slowing me down. That's right. It's Earth's gravity slowing you down, and that's why you're you're late for the. Professional underwater needle points uh, exhibition, which would be puny exhibition. P U N E, puny. Yep. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> With an L. With an L. <laughs> With an L. Exactly. Uh, it turns out, Bruiser, if I if I have this theme right, I think I do. Uh, yeah, there it is. Airbnb, Lyft, and Uber have all expressed interest in using Clearview AI. No. Yeah. I use all of those. <laughs> Your life is about to be taken over by Skynet. No. The tech companies expressed interest in using Clearview AI's technology for identity verification. Your identity is about to be stolen by Skynet. <laughs> I just love being paranoid of computers. Uh, tech giants Airbnb, Lyft, and Uber have expressed interest in using technology from controversial facial recognition firm Clearview AI for identity verification, according to a statement from Clearview AI CEO Juan Tan. That what? <laughs> that is not his name. You made that up. I did not. <laughs> his name is Juan Tan. That Juan Tan. That Mister. It is H O A N Juan <laughs> Tan T O N or Tan Juan Tan that. What would you like for dinner today? Juan Tan that. <laughs> Juan Tan that, buddy. Right there. <laughs> How can you trust a guy named Juan Tan that? Come on, people. <laughs> uh, he provided that to Motherboard. He said, hey, Motherboard, Juan Tan that. <laughs> All three of the companies. Denied the claim in statements to Motherboard. Of course they did, because they want to take over the universe one computer at a time. God, that sounds so menacing. Uh, The news signals how Clearview AI may expand its products beyond investigative tools for law enforcement. Previously, the company explored partnerships with members of the private sector, such as Macy's and Walmart, before promising to cancel all contracts with private companies, BuzzFeed News previously reported. Now the statement sent on Tuesday highlights the issue of the proliferation of facial recognition technology again. There's no current plans to work with the companies you mentioned. They said they are examples of the types of firms who have expressed interest in Clearview AI's facial recognition technology for the purposes of consent-based identity verification since there are a lot of issues with crimes that happen on the platforms. Ton that statement, Red. <laughs> yeah, but they're, they're getting it wrong. The AI, the, like facial recognition should be for the person waiting for the Uber, not the Uber driver picking somebody up. Yeah. Because there's numerous times where you you look at your phone and your picture of your Uber driver doesn't have – they only give you a picture – oh, no, they give you a picture of both the car and the driver. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I'm, I'm terrified. I don't – why would Walmart need to know my facial recognition? <laughs> because, Bruiser, you might not be you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I did. <laughs> it works. You might be a robot. That means the dog should bark at me. That's true. Would... The dog should bark at you. Yeah. But Bruiser, that's not all. That's not all, my friend. Oh, that's no. not where Skynet stops and more of begin. Not. They don't stop till they have. They're bathing in our blood, stepping on our skulls. That's true. I think this one is an audio daily double. I think um, this one says there's a shocking plan to microchip everyone by 2026. But I don't want to play the story. I don't. I, I people may be listening to this before bed. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's fine. That's all right. We'll just mention that one. You're going to be microchipped before 2026. 
but I could do it like this. Are you ready? I'll do it like this. You may be microchipped before 2026. Then I can do my Alex Jones. Are you ready for this? I got to have my drink near me because I'll start choking if I don't. That's right, folks. You're going to be microchipped by 2026. Here's the deal. You're going to want to take your vitamins. You're going to want to take your other stuff. Take your bleach. Drink your bleach. Take your vitamins because you don't want to take that microchip. That's right. You're going to be a walking cyborg by 2026. (laughs) How's that for Alex Jones? We're technically already walking microchips because everyone walks around with their cell phone in their pocket. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And your credit cards and... And your credit cards and everything. Mm-hmm. Social media. Social media. There, you know, I, yeah. people always check in. Hey, this is where I'm at. Oh, I forgot. We've got one more. <laughs> we'll just get them all out of the way in one one Do shot it. here. Yeah, people send me these stories all week long, and I I, I forget. I need to get them out of the way. Because they know we're terrified of AI. <laughs> yeah, there's that, yeah. What's the most dangerous emerging technology? What could go wrong? Soon we will be able to write any virus genome from scratch, Bruiser. Oh, God. Do you people just want me to piss and shit myself in my sleep every night? Is this what you're doing? Does this make you laugh? I think they do, Bruiser. They want to see me have a nervous breakdown. They do. Why would you want it? This makes no sense. <sighs> you don't want to. You don't want to read this. <laughs> you don't want to read about I can create a virus. This comes from Gizmodo. Uh, those inclined to think apocalyptically, like yours truly, know that tech in its purest form spells civilizational disaster. It is true that we might never see a world filled with violent, hypertrophic CRISPR babies. That's not true. (laughs) Spelled in capital letters, C-R-I-S-P-R, babies. And uncontrollable self-driving cars. We will see that. It's already happening. It's already already happening. And AI intent on twisting humans into paper clips. We will see that. Yeah. I'm going to be a robot's desk. Like weight, a paperweight someday. I, you and me both. <laughs> Our tech hastened and this guy understands me. This guy who wrote this is in my head. <laughs> Our tech hastened and if and when it does arrive, we'll probably look a bit different and we'll probably suck in ways we cannot yet imagine. This guy writes. <laughs> it's like he's my soulmate. He should tuck me in at night. Yeah. Why don't scientists talk like that? Like, oh, we just created this new uh, website that uh, it's going to make your life suck so bad. <laughs> yeah. It's, he says in the meantime, though, it's worth wondering, what's the most dangerous emerging technology? For this week's, uh, for this week's Giz Asks, we reached out to a number of experts to find out. Are you ready for uh, nightmare material here? Oh, yeah. Okay, the Zephyr Teachout, uh, Associate Professor of Law from Fordham University, says private workplace surveillance. It upends the already awful employer-employee power dynamics by allowing employers to treat employees like guinea pigs with vast asymmetrics of information, knowing what motivates them to work in unhealthy ways and how they can extract more value for less pay. It allows them to weed out dissidents with early warning systems and destroy solidarity through differential treatment. Gambling research taught casinos how to put together gambling profiles to customize appeals to be able to earn as much as possible off of each gambler's weaknesses. That technology now entering the workforce on the verge of ubiquity unless we stop it. How do you like them apples? So they're watching you at work, and that's the worst yep. you could have. To and they get, their guinea pig was casinos. That's right, to get you to work harder. <laughs> Michael Littman, professor of computer science at Brown University, says this nightmare fuel is, is new to you. You ready for this? <clears throat> okay. The 2021 AI 100 report released last month 
included a section on the most pressing dangers of artificial intelligence. The 17 expert panel expressed the opinion that as AI systems prove to be increasingly beneficial in real world applications, they have broadened their reach, causing risks of misuse, overuse, and explicit abuse to proliferate. One of the panel's biggest concerns about AI is techno solutionism, the attitude that technology like AI can be used to solve any problem. The aura of neutrality and impartiality that many people associate with AI decision making results in er, decision making results in systems being accepted as objective and helpful, even though they may be applied inappropriately and can be built on the results of biased historical decisions or even blatant discrimination without transparency concerning either the data or the AI algorithms that interpret it. The public may be left in the dark as to how decisions that materially impact their lives are being made. AI systems are being used in service of disinformation on the internet, giving them the potential to become a threat to democracy and a tool for fascism. Insufficient thought given to the human factors of AI integration has led to oscillation between mistrust of AI-based systems and over-reliance in those systems. AI algorithms are playing a role in decisions uh, concerning distributing organs, vaccines, and other elements of healthcare, meaning these approaches have literal life and death stakes. The dangers of AI automation are mitigated if, on matters of consequence, the people and organizations responsible for the outcomes play a central role in how AI systems are brought to bear. Engaging all relevant stakeholders can drastically slow the delivery of AI solutions to hard problems, but it's necessary. Uh, the downsides of misapplied technology are too great. Technologists would be well served to adopt a version of the healthcare dictum. First, do no harm. So in other words, AI used for evil purposes. They, these guys that create this stuff have to realize their intentions might be good, them themselves, mm -hmm. but the people that get a hold of it will not have good intentions. Everything that's ever been created has someone's found a way of using it in a negative way. You know, we created this, uh, the telephone to get a hold of each other. Prank calls became a thing. You know what yep. I mean? Like, yep. someone's going to find a way to use it for evil? Yeah. Yeah. The last one here, if you're ready for this nightmare fuel. Mm, actually, this is the last one we'll read. I don't know that I could take much more of this. <laughs> Too much AI. Yeah. What a bummer. Oh, wait. This guy comes from Evil Online. This one's pretty bad. Let's see. This one thinks the most dangerous technologies are, in a sense, social or cognitive technologies that prevent people from having a clear view of the world and the needs of others. <laughs> That's one guy. Another guy says, oh, wait, this is Amy Webb, author of The Genesis Machine, Our Quest to Rewrite Life in the Age of Synthetic Biology. She says the most dangerous emerging technology is biology, or rather synthetic biology, which has a singular goal to gain access to cells in order to write new and possibly better biological code. She says synthetic biology is a field of science that applies engineering, artificial intelligence, genetics, and chemistry to redesign biological parts and organisms with enhanced abilities and new purposes. A.K.A. clones and terminators. Cyborgs. Yep. Clones and terminators. Dude, this is nightmare fuel. Ryan Callow, professor of law, chair, president, and provost of the task force on Technology and Society and faculty co-founder of the Tech Policy Lab and the Center for an Informed Public at the University of Washington. His title alone will put you to sleep at night. <laughs> says, my candidate for the most dangerous emerging technology is quantum computing. Because that'll put you to sleep at night, too. Uh, yeah. With the possible exception of breaking encryption, the dangers of quantum computing are not new. Rather, quantum computing ac accelerates threats to privacy and autonomy that began in the era of supercomputing. With access to enough data and processing power, today's computer systems are increasingly capable of deriving the intimate from the available. 
I'm worried quantum computing will help shepherd in a world in which every government and company is Sherlock Holmes, guessing all our secrets based on information we don't even think to hide. They want to steal our information. See? Steal your life. Someone thought quantum computing would be great, you know, could save the world. And then somebody else went, hey, I can find out your Netflix password with it. That's right. You know who's not safe from supercomputing? Who? The QAnon leader. <laughs> <laughs> I swear this is the last one I have. Someone just skipped ahead 20 minutes and went, God damn it, they're still on this shit. <laughs> Turns out, Bruiser, that the QAnon founder may have been found thanks to Skynet. They found him, huh? Yeah. It's true. They sent Arnold after him? They did. <laughs> Stop if you don't want to be found. Turns out that uh, thanks to machine learning, uh, researchers believe two men the were... The machines are learning, aren't they? They are. They're learning. Turns out that uh, two men were the primary authors of posts attributed to Q. Okay. <laughs> it's like found both of them, huh? They found both of them. <laughs> you found me in my mom's basement. Can I have another peanut butter and jelly sandwiches with the crust cut off, please? Ah, meatloaf. <laughs> meatloaf. Can I get it with ketchup on it instead of gravy this time? With help from machine learning software, that's what they call it in the country, uh, computer scientists may have unmasked the identity of Q, the founder of the QAnon movement. In a sprawling report published on Saturday, the New York Times shared the findings of two independent teams of forensic linguists. They're talented with their tongues and their fingers. Look at them. Look at that, ladies. Uh, who claim they've identified Paul Ferber, a South African software developer who was one of the first to draw attention to the conspiracy theory as the original writer behind Q. They say Arizona congressional candidate Ron Watkins, who also wrote under the pseudonym, first by collaborating with Ferber and then later taking over the account with when it eventually moved to post on his father's 8chan uh, message board. Uh, the two teams of Swiss and French researchers uh, use different methodologies to come up with the ins- uh, with the same conclusion. I also almost said the insane conclusion. The same conclusion. Uh, the Swiss one made up of two researchers from startup uh, Orf Analytics use software to break down Q's missives into patterns of three character sequences. They then tracked how often those sequences repeated. Uh, the French team, meanwhile, trained an AI to look for patterns in Q's writings. Uh, both techniques broadly fall under an approach known as stylomet- stylomet- stylometry, stylometry uh, that looks to analyze a writing in a way that is measurable, consistent, and replicable uh, to avoid the possibility of confusing their respective programs. The teams limited their analysis to social media posts. Among all the other possible authors they put through the test, they say the writings of Ferber and Watkins stood out the most to how similar it was of that of Q's. So there you go. That's how they got the Zodiac Killer or broke his code. Yeah. Was that that process there. That's true. It's so true. They can solve a, was that a 40 year old serial killer case. They can find some guy in his mom's basement. They probably could. They probably could. Oh, you know what? Uh, I, I, I have I have good news and I have bad news. Okay, let's do uh, let's do the bad news first. Do the bad news first. Yeah. The bad news is I lied. There's one more of these and then we'll go to break. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the good news is we're going to break after this one. <laughs> Deep mind scientists say they've trained an AI to control a nuclear fusion reactor. This is the end of the world right here. I saved the best for last. Yeah, yeah. This is it. This is how. This is how we go. <laughs> this is how we end up dying. Uh, essentially, it is this bruiser, and then uh, and then we can tuck our 
our head between our legs and kiss our ass goodbye. The London-based AI lab, which is owned by Alphabet, announced Wednesday that it has trained an AI system to control and sculpt a superheated plasma inside a nuclear fusion reactor. Oh, come on. That, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's like, hey. Hey, that's like a, a a kindergarten teacher going. All right, well we have we have the codes of the nukes. What should we do? Let's give him the little Billy there in the front row <laughs> and let he'll him keep, do it. He'll keep them safe. Nuclear fusion, in case you were confused, is a process that powers the stars of the universe. Involves smashing and fusing hydrogen, which is a common element of seawater, and then giving it to the AI. <laughs> um. <laughs> DeepMind claimed that the breakthrough published in the journal Nature could open new avenues that advance nuclear fusion research. Of course, until you give it to the robots and then they go and turn it against humanity, they don't deserve to live. Watch me fry the whole planet. All right, that's enough of that nonsense. We've That's He's enough. Prob- He's probably messaging all of his other AI buddies and goes, how do you like your humans, crispy or extra crispy? Exactly. Oh, boy. All right. Well, when we come back, birds are crashing into the ground in Mexico. We'll try to find out why that is. We've got new snow monsters to look into. We'll talk about that when we get back. And there's a case of a ghost gunshot that we'll talk about. Yeah. Sounds interesting. That is. We'll talk about that when we come back. And I promise, no more AI. When we come back, we're done. No dealing, more. We're done dealing with the mystery machines. Besides, the one I'm sitting in front of may attack me if I talk any more <laughs> about it. More supernatural news coming up when we come back right here on the Best in Paranormal Podcasting. This is Darkness Radio. Welcome back to Darkness Radio on a Supernatural News Wednesday. I'm Tim Dennis, along with Beer City Bruiser. And boy, have we got more stories for you, none of which involve Bruiser AI. Good. That, that was scary. <laughs> that last one especially. <laughs> oh, what, the AI playing with the nuclear fusion? Oh, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, that mm-hmm. sounds like a great idea. Sure, why not? Uh, well, it's either that or, or start, a new, uh, start a new football league. Uh, <laughs> have them play in that. Um, you know, it's one or the other. That's all I got to say about that. You know, I get it. Yeah, I get it. They, they should play baseball. That way, we can actually have a baseball season. Well, yeah. I mean, come on. I mean, what's up with that? I mean, for real. Uh, we go to Mexico, Bruiser, where a viral video is showing birds crashing into the ground in Mexico. <laughs> it's got a few theories. Uh, one, they forgot how to fly. I mean, that's the most obvious one. That happens. You yeah. know, they get old. They do. They get old. They forget to flap the wings. And then... Um, two, eh, vertigo. <laughs> do birds get vertigo? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it could ha- It happened to Kenny Omega. It can happen to birds. I, I've had vertigo, and it, it's, it sucks. <laughs> yeah. So I can see why all the birds are crashing if they have vertigo. Uh, third, birds aren't real. I've heard this. Yeah, I've heard this conspiracy theory. You know, this guy was on TV recently saying it was all just an act. Well, I'm assuming that's what it was. If you if you read all the stuff that he put out. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, uh, he actually came out on TV and said, well, the whole thing's an act. But he got everybody. He, he, that's, he that's did get everybody. Part. Yeah. That's the best part is he got people to actually believe it. But, but people were buying into it. Oh, yeah. There was actual diagrams breaking down how a pigeon's body is a camera, a microphone, and a drone. <laughs> I know some people who are actually buying into it. It was pretty funny. <laughs> I, I haven't met anybody yet that was serious about it, but I have had discussions in, in my conspiracy groups about it. <laughs> Were people buying into it? Uh, one one girl was on the fence. She was she was there. She's like, I've, I've seen birds 
act really weird. And she, she brought up like, how come like a bird will fly into a window or something? And I said, well, it's just a clean window. <laughs> like, yeah, not, there's, it's not real. There's <laughs> not like, a lot of out there. Was it dead? <laughs> there's not a lot of crap on the window. They see themselves. They're going to say <laughs> hi. I mean, they're birds. They, yeah. they're not the smartest in the world. That's why they're called bird brains. That's mm. actually how I saw the diagram. And she's like, you know, well, well they have diagrams. I would, they have diagrams. Well, I don't know. Someone's an artist and thought it'd be fun to draw. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's good stuff. Well, a video of a flock of birds crashing into the ground in Mexico uh, shows <laughs> a phenomenon that shook the internet uh, last week. It, it's a naturally occurring instinct in the species, according to experts. <laughs> well, you know what? We did for years have a dodo bird that would follow each other. Literally to an extent to extinction. So true, very true. <laughs> so birds that just randomly fly into the ground, <laughs> that, I get it. It could it could happen. Uh, dozens of dead birds were discovered in the northern Mexican state of Chihuahua on February seventh, and a security camera recorded the incident. An ecologist said the incident was likely caused by a predator and the bird's instinctive defensive response, known as a murmuration. That was a that was a line from a Dr. Dre song, a couple twenty years ago, wasn't it? Uh, no, sure. I think no. He played at the Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah. It was no hateration, holleration, murmuration, <laughs> doing this dance for me, right? Isn't that yeah. the that's the line, right? That's it. Yep. That's yep. it. Who knew he was in the bird have bird stuff? <laughs> He's into bird stuff. <laughs> Dr. Dre is. Uh, this looks like a raptor, like a peregrine or hawk has been chasing a flock like they do with murmurating starlings. And they have crashed as the flock was forced low, said Richard Broughton, uh, an ecologist with the UK Center for Ecology and Hydrology, according to The Guardian. I just pictured two hawks sitting next to each other on a branch going, hey, man, you want to see something cool? Watch this. <laughs> <laughs> ah! <laughs> Look, they all flew into the ground. <laughs> with a little bird narrator in the background going, it takes one to crush them all. <laughs> uh, as the birds begin to flee from the predator, which is not visible in the video, each reacts to the movements of the birds around it. You can see that you can see that they act like a wave at the beginning as if they're being flushed from above, he, he added, according to the report. Uh, Alexander Lees, a lecturer at Manchester Metropolitan University, agreed, saying the birds can react so forcefully that they die upon impacting a solid object. Uh, the Guardian, or Lee's reported, <laughs> let me back up here, Lee's saying to the Guardian said, for my part and from one video and no toxicology, I'd say the most probable cause is the flock murmurating to avoid a predator, predatory raptor and hitting the ground. Uh, there's always... There always seems to be a knee-jerk response to blame environmental pollutants, but collisions with infrastructure are very common. In a tightly packed flock, the birds are following the movements of the bird in front rather than actually interpreting their wider surroundings, so it isn't unexpected that such events happen occasionally, he added, according to the report. In an unrelated incident across the Atlantic Ocean, in Wales, 200 birds were found dead in another bizarre instance that has baffled people online. And when they get the toxicology report back and they're all turn out to be really drunk. <laughs> 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 or I got it here, Tim. I figured it out. Okay. The drone operator that was operating them. Yes. Yeah. Sneezed and hit up on the joystick, so they all took a nosedive. That's exactly what it was. You got it, my friend. You figured it out. See? It wasn't or that tough. Drunk. Or they're drunk. <laughs> or they're drunk. Yeah, you figured it out. It wasn't that tough after all, see? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we move on. And this comes from, you know, before you, before you guys go, where the hell do you get your news from? This one right here came from AccuWeather. Oh. Yeah. That's a pretty legitimate thing. I, I get weather from there when Le I travel. Legitimate news source says that a stunning sea of snow monsters took over a volcanic mountainside. <laughs> Thank you, AccuWeather. <laughs> Meanwhile, somebody's getting their weed from Snoop Dogg over at AccuWeather. Mm -hmm. 
Just saying. Uh, it says, welcome to the land of the snow monsters. New drone footage shows breathtaking images of these giant creatures, in quotes, that seem to have conquered the wintry landscape, but soon will be gone. Uh-oh. <laughs> I, think I, I think I bit on an article here. Uh-huh. From AccuWeather. At an elevation of more than 6,000 feet near the top of a volcano exists a land of snow monsters, a mountainside that is home to fleeting figures that come each winter and then fade along with the cold weather that, or as spring approaches. It might sound like material from a scary children's book, but these monsters are nothing to fear. They're just one of nature's quirky and unique creations that materialize in wintertime. On the summit of the volcanic Mount Zao in Japan, about 220 miles north of Tokyo, an unusual natural phenomenon gives birth to snowy monster-like figures every year. The strange occurrence, which the Japanese call, uh, I believe it's Zhuo, or Zhuyo, uh, leads to the creation of thousands of snow monsters. Notice I'm doing the air quotes here for you, Bruiser. Uh, that rest on the mountain during the winter. Uh, those who come to see the monsters can safely walk near them, ski or snowboard alongside the creatures, or view them from the comfort of a cable car while enjoying stunning views of Japan. The snow monsters can look even cooler at night, as some of the monsters are illuminated in a variety of flashy colors. Some footage captured recently from above shows a frozen sea of snow monsters uh, festooning the mountainside. Oh, you know what? This is one of those... Damn it, they got me again. <laughs> I'm waiting for you to say it was a Japanese, like, snowman building festival. That's exactly what it is. It's the same <laughs> thing we hit the other day. You remember? Do you yeah. remember this from? Yeah. Are oh, you yeah, seeing yeah. the picture? Yeah. Do you remember the sand pic- the sand sculpture yep. story we had? That was AccuWeather 2, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Sons of bitches. Let's see. They got this. you. They got me again. All right, screw you, AccuWeather. <laughs> Those weathermen with their sense of humor. It's not even that, really, if you think about it. Maybe they're just big fans of the show and they want to constantly get on here. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think that's what it is, sons of bitches. Uh, we'll move on. <laughs> that's that's what we do. Let's talk about this mystery, mystery, mysterious, mysterious mystery uh, surrounding a case of a man who was hit by a ghost gunshot. I know this one's legit. It's not AccuWeather. It wasn't a guy who was hit with a snowball. Yeah, it turns out it was just a potato gun. Yeah. Well, God, don't say that. Now I'll probably get cursed, and it will be. It was a guy who was hit with a slingshot with a pebble in it. Uh, okay, so the man had been walking outside when he was hit by a bullet that seemed to come out of nowhere. Good, a bullet. He had hit with a bullet. Now we're talking. Uh, the peculiar We're incident. So excited for this man to be shot by I a know. bullet. Tip. Yeah, we go what to Zachy Weather Dundee. We go to Switzerland where they use real ammo. Um, <laughs> I thought they're supposed to be neutral. Well, not in this case. Uh, the peculiar incident, which happened last Thursday in the town of Fraunfeld in Switzerland, involved a 38-year-old man who'd been outside with his two children and another adult when he suddenly felt an intense, sharp pain in his lower body. Uh, when he went to the emergency room at the local hospital, he was told by doctors that he had been, in fact, shot and that the bullet was still lodged inside him. Fortunately, his injuries were not severe. and The doctors were able to remove the bullet and treat the wound. However, nobody could explain exactly where the bullet had come from. Uh, at the time, the shooting at the time of the shooting, neither he nor anyone he was with had heard any sort of gunshot and there had been no sign of anyone with a gun in the vicinity. Okay. Go figure on that one, huh? Yeah. Uh, the bullet itself hasn't revealed much in the way of clues, either than, or, or anything in the way of clues either, other than the fact that the gun was likely a very low-caliber weapon. Otherwise, it would have done much more damage. A police investigation has since been launched in an attempt to get to the bottom of the mystery. Maybe a kid was playing with an air gun, said weapons expert Martin Earhard. Uh, if a small caliber weapon was actually involved, someone must have handled the firearm with gross negligence. But here's the deal. Nobody heard a gunshot. 
Yeah, you're gonna hear a gunshot, whether it be a 22 or a 45. Like you're gonna hear a gunshot. Yeah, you'll hear. Even a- with air rifles, you do that, and air rifles can't shoot bullets. Right, you'll hear a pop, but yeah. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Yeah, even if it's from a long distance, you still hear the pop. Right, right. We got three stories left in today's supernatural news. Um, I'm gonna save a story for the last. The, the very last uh, story here, you know, a lot of people uh, will email me and they'll say, you know, I want to I want to have a lucid dream and I want to contact my my relatives or my loved ones in my sleep that have passed on. OK, I've had those. So, so we're going to we're going to talk about lucid dreaming as the last thing. OK, today, that's what we're going to do rather than go out on a funny Ha ha moment. We'll we'll talk about something a little serious on the way out. Okay. In the meantime, let's talk about astronauts and the fact that their brain re- rewires itself during a long duration space flight. See, I've heard there's numerous physical aspects um, because of the weightlessness. Mm-hmm. So I, I I firmly believe that their brain could be rewired because you have to learn how to redo stuff up there. It does turn out that the brains of astronauts are rewired during long-duration space flight to help them adapt to their unusual environment. This according to a new study. An international team led by the University of Antwerp in Belgium studied the brains of Russian cosmonauts who had been to space for an average of 172 days. Brains change and adapt to both in both structure and function throughout our lives, but this new study found the effects of spaceflight can trigger its own changes. Uh, the results show significant microstructural changes in several white matter tracks, such as the sensor, sensory motor tracks responsible for sensory motor and processing. The study funded by the European Space Agency and Roscosmos uh, will form the basis for future research into the full scope of brain changes during space travel. The cosmonauts involved in the study have not been named by the researchers. As human exploration of space reaches new horizons, such as spending longer in low Earth orbit, as well as travel to the moon and back and to Mars, uh, understanding the effects of spaceflight on human brains is crucial, the team said. Previous research has shown that spaceflight has the potential to alter both the shape and function of an adult brain. Leader author Dr. Floris Widas uh, and colleagues investigated structural changes in the brain after spaceflight at the level of deep brain white matter tracks. This is the part of the brain responsible for communication between gray matter and the body, as well as between various gray matter regions. In short, white matter is the channel of communication of the brain, and gray matter is where information processing is done. To study brain structure and function after spaceflight, uh, the researchers used a brain imaging technique called fiber tracti- tractography. Fiber tractography. Never had one done. Neither have I. I was going <laughs> to say, between you and I, one of us will have it done someday, I'm, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, Fiber tractography gives a sort of wiring scheme of the brain. Uh, Our study is the first to use this specific method to detect changes in brain structure after spaceflight, explained Dr. Whitus. Whitus and his team uh, acquired diffusion MRI scans of 12 male cosmonauts before and right after their space flights. They also collected eight follow-up scans seven months after space flight. The cosmonauts sent to space by the Russian space agency Roscosmos all engaged in long-duration missions of an average length of 172 days. The researchers found proof of the concept of the learned brain, which is the level of neuroplasticity the brain has to adapt to space flight. We found changes in the neural connections between several motor areas of the brain, said first author uh, Andre Doroshin of Drexel University. Motor areas of our uh, brain centers where commands or movements are initiated and in weightlessness, an astronaut needs to adapt his or her, her movement strategies drastically compared to Earth. Our study shows that their brain is rewired, so to speak. 
Follow-up scans seven months after they returned to Earth revealed that the changes from spaceflight were still visible in the brain. From previous studies, we know that these motor areas show signs of adaptation after spaceflight. Now we have first indication that this is also reflected at the level of connections between those two regions, uh, Dr. White said. The authors also discovered an explanation for anatomical brain shifts observed after space flights. Uh, we initially thought to have detected changes in the corpus callosum, which is the uh, central highway connecting both hemispheres of the brain, explained the doctor. The corpus callosum borders the brain's ventricles, communicating network of chambers filled with fluid, which expand because of space flight. The structural changes we initially found in the corpus callosum are actually caused by the dilation of the ventricles that induce anatomical shifts of the adjacent neural tissue, where initially it was thought that there were real structural changes in the brain. We only observed shape changes. This puts findings in a different perspective, he went on to say. So interesting stuff about the brain and spaceflight. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, you're up there with no gravity. Um, you know, like they've, they've said people, you get taller and, uh, just like different things. So I can see your brain changing, especially if you're up there for a long period of time. Yeah. It's not like in the movies where, you know, they have anti-gravity on the ship so you can walk around like normal, like they're floating constantly 24 hours a day. Oh yeah. Yep. All right. This next story, we go to Bolivia where a Bolivian house with devil sculptures has spooked a Highland city. These, the yeah, okay. I'm going to try and show you this here through our connection. See if you can check this out. Do you see these sculptures? It looks like a, a Metallica album cover. <laughs> I was going to say, doesn't it? It doesn't look like an album cover. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It, it looks a little creepy. There's a, there's a there's a creep factor there. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's cool looking, I think. But if it's, I don't know. It, like I said, it looks like a meta, uh, metal album cover. Exactly. Uh, we go to El Alto, Bolivia, where a Bolivian miner has covered his house with sculptures of longhorn devils. That'd be a great football team name. Yeah. I'm going to say that's a great football team name or even an, a metal band with the longhorn devils. The longhorn devils. And other scary creatures intended as a playful nod to the country's colonial past, uh, but which has instead shocked some neighbors who fear a link to occult rituals. The Adobe Brick House, brick house uh, in the uh, high-altitude city of El Alto belongs to David, I believe this is Choquet. We'll just go with that. Uh, who hired an artist to create the skeletal devils from cement and wood and installed them on his roof, doors, and walls. <laughs> <laughs> There's an imprint of a black skull on Choquet's front door and giant teeth around one window frame uh, below which an intricate, intricately carved dragon lurks. Choquet told Reuters that he hoped the spooky house could spur local tourism. <laughs> I don't know that, that that much money is coming in from the, the, the spooky house. Oh, yeah, he's house. got no money. I'd, I'd go visit the town. But do you think his neighbors, when his neighbors saw him moved in, they all looked around and went, oh, great, he's going to be that neighbor. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, Closed-minded people will think it's something supernatural, but people need to open their minds and see it as a tourist attraction, something <laughs> that can improve the area, said Choke, uh, who comes from a mining family. It'll bring good things, not evil, he went on to say. Choke added that the sculptures are an illusion to life in Bolivian mines centuries ago during Spanish colonial rule when local indigenous men were frightened and forced into digging for silver. The colonial masters would show miners images of devils and warn them that they would be abducted by the spirits if they refused to work. Over three centuries of Spanish domination, Bolivia, like Mexico, was a major source of silver that was shipped to Asia in exchange for goods like porcelain and silk in one of the world's first major commodity trades. Some neighbors see the devils from Choquet's house or on Choquet's house, um, many with their mouths bared in grotesque grins as signals to satanic worshipers. And Choquet laments that he is battling baseless rumors. One resident, Maria Laurel, 
uh, said she has heard talk of naked rituals in the house. Oh, it's a party <laughs> house. Yeah, He's got to be like, no, that's just a Saturday night for me. That's right. Uh, the neighbors here are scared, Maria Laurel went on to say. Uh, she said as she leaned against her car, the truth is it frightens me. Choquet denied any such rituals and noted that similar depictions of devils appear on altars at mine entrances where workers often leave offerings, including cocoa leaves and alcohol, believing that this will protect them in the mines. That's what he wants. He wants free beer. He just wants people yeah. to leave free beer. He wants free beer and cocoa leaves. Yeah, it's free beer and hot chocolate. <laughs> beer and hot chocolate <laughs> for everybody. Hoppa. Uh, actually, I think cocoa leaves produce cocaine, don't they? Okay, so he wants to have a serious party. That's right. <laughs> he wants a party where we can, we we all can stay stay up all night. They wanted they're they're saying there's all those naked rituals. He goes, no, not until I get my alcohol and cocoa leaves. That's right. Then there's going to be a party. Daddy wants cocaina. <laughs> Uh, and finally, uh, today in Supernatural News, uh, there's an article in Psychology Today that tells you how to increase your odds of lucid dreaming. Now, Bruiser, on the, on the program previously, we've talked about how some people believe that when you have a lucid dream, you can actually connect to the other side yeah. and talk to loved ones. Psychology Today is telling us that lucid dreams can be fun and empowering. And they also say that not everyone has lucid dreams, and one may increase the possibility of lucid dreaming with helpful t tips. I almost said something else. <laughs> with helpful tips. Why not? Um, lucid dreaming occurs when the dreamer is aware of the fact that she or he is dreaming while the dream is taking place. Now, not everyone has lucid dreams, but one may increase the possibility with the following tips. Uh, excerpt from a book written by this particular author. The author is Preston Nee, uh, spelled N-I, uh, M-S-B-A, in communi Communication Success. Um, and the book is called How to Interpret Your Dreams, Keys to Insight and Empowerment. And I'm going to look up Preston Nee and see if we can't get Preston on the show. That'd be great. Yeah. Now, uh, the, the tip is this. Try one or more of these tips for a few days in a row or whenever you would like to increase the likelihood of lucid dreaming. Practice the tips as long as they feel comfortable to you. If for some reason they do not feel good, stop the exercise and try something else, including simply having a normal night's sleep. Now, here's tip number one. Make a conscious intention to have a lucid dream before you go to sleep. For example, say to yourself, I would like to consciously fly in my dream, or I would like to consciously meet some old friends in my dream. Keep your intention or keep your intentional affirmation statements general without a specific deadline, i.e., don't say, I will or I must fly in my dream tonight. Just put forth the intention to your subconscious and to the universe and have them work on your behalf. Your lucid dream, if you have one, may or may not be that one that you intended, and that's perfectly okay. So just put it forward. Just say, I, I want to fly in my dream tonight, or I would like to consciously fly in my dream tonight. So there you go. Just put that forward. Make a conscious intention to have a lucid dream. Basically, put it out in the universe. That's right. So that's tip number one. Number two, as you drift to sleep, use your, use your observer self to notice yourself falling asleep. So number two, uh, for example, note to yourself, I'm getting groggy or I'm getting sleepier, as if you're watching a movie of yourself falling asleep. Condition your mind to get used to the experience of observing yourself as you fall asleep. So it may be easier to observe yourself when you're dreaming as well. Almost like you're out of body. It's, it's almost like hypnosis, too. Yeah, exactly. You know, hypnosis, they suggest that, too. Yep. So there you go. Observe yourself for tip number two. Tip number three, if you have a positive, not lucid dream with certain aspects, you wish See if I'm reading this right. Number three, if you have a positive, not lucid dream with certain aspects you wish included in a lucid dream, as soon as you wake up, say to yourself, next time I have this dream, I will. 
For yeah. example, if you have a dream where you saw your children, or I'm sorry, where you had, let me try that again. For example, if you have a dream where you saw your childhood friend from a distance, say to yourself, one or more of the following affirmations after you awake. Next time I have this dream, I will meet my friend close up. Next time I have this dream, I will greet and hug my friend. Next time I have this dream, we will play our favorite childhood game. Next time I have this dream, my friend and I will go on an adventure together. So there you go. If you have that positive dream, not lucid again, but a positive dream, Mm -hmm. next time you'll go further into the dream with that person. Uh, The fourth tip, similarly, if you have a difficult, again, not lucid dream, but a difficult dream with certain details you didn't like, as soon as you wake up, say to yourself, next time if I have this dream, I will. For example, if you have a dream where someone is bothering you and you're annoyed, say to yourself one or more of the following affirmations after you awake. Next time if I have this dream, I will fly away. Next time... If I have this dream, I will turn around and I will assertively tell this person to go away or disappear. Next time after I have this dream, I will feel confident, strong, and creative in my ability to handle the situation. And next time if I have this dream, I will use my superpower or my lucid dream power to change the dream content to something more fun and empowering. Again, your lucid dream, if you have one, may or may not be the one that you intended. Dreams often work in mysterious and unexpected ways. So there you go. I like that it's teaching you to take control, that you can control your dreams. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like so many of us just don't think we have that much control because we're sleeping. When actually you do have control of your subconscious. And and those tips are perfect for how to to kind of navigate, you know, Regular dreams, lucid dreams, and difficult dreams. Yeah, and a lot of it, especially with the affirmations, you're, you're programming, as you put it, you're programming your self-conscious before yep. you even jump into your dream. Yep, and you're putting, uh, put positive out, put positive out. There's always that thinking, you, know, you put positive out, positive comes back. And why does it have to stop on this plane? It can continue on the, the dream plane also. Exactly, exactly. So that's it. That's our, our stories for this week. Again, if you uh, we want to get Parashare going here, folks. Uh, so let's get it going. Uh, if you've got a paranormal experience that you want to share with us, you can email me, Tim at DarknessRadio.com. Uh, let's get those emails flowing in here. Get your email in here. Bruiser and I want to read your email here online and share your paranormal experience with everybody. Uh, Tim at DarknessRadio.com. You can also send us your recorded experience, 651-300-4977, 651-300-4977. We'll not only play your experience here on the air, we'll also answer any questions you have. So if you tell us your experience and you want to ask either one of us a question as to why you went through that experience or if you just want to know what it was that happened to you, uh, we'd be glad to weigh in on your experience as well after we play your audio. So 651-300-4977 is the number for the Parashare line. Uh, we want to hear from you. We want to play your experiences here on the air. Uh, so please do that as well. So either Tim at DarknessRadio.com for your Parashare emails or 651-300-4977. Let's get your Parashare going here. We we love talking to each other, but we want to hear from you as well, and we want to hear from the Darkness Radio audience and get your Parashare experiences here on the air. We want to be interactive with you. And uh, again, I love getting all your emails and, and your support here uh, for uh, for the show. There's a lot of emails I haven't shared with with Bruiser that I, I'm going to hear over the next few weeks and the support that you've been uh, showing the show. And, and you guys are loving Beer City Bruiser. I just haven't told him because, you know, he's got a big enough head already. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> really? No, well, no, I'm no. I'm happy if they're loving it. I'm, I'm having a great time. And I, fans reach out to me on my socials and I try to connect with them. And it's this is a blast. I'm having a great time. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, it, you guys have been super supportive of Beer City Bruiser and, and being on the show, and and uh, and we'll be uh, we'll be working in uh, Mally Fox and and uh, and Jessica Freeberg as well. I know next week, Bruiser, you've got uh, you got a big loop you're going to be on. 
Um, so we're going to bring in one or the other. We'll bring somebody in next week. Um, tell people, and speaking of, tell people where you're going to be here in the next few weeks uh, on that p- professional underwater needlepoint deal. <laughs> so my my uh, adventure this weekend begins. I what's called a triple shot weekend, meaning I'm going to be needlepointing Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Friday, I'm in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Um, mm-hmm. Get to go up there. I haven't been there in a while. Uh, Saturday, I get to debut for the Monster Factory in Paulsboro, New Jersey. Nice. I'm real excited about that. And not only that, my hotel is in Philly, and it's rumored to have some activity. So I'm hoping. Really? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you did that on purpose or not, but a buddy of mine from Philly you know, asked where I was staying, and I told him. He goes, Check this floor. Okay, I will. And then Sunday, I return back here to Milwaukee at Turner Hall Ballroom, uh, make my debut for Zello Pro in and, and probably one of my most favorite swimming pools of all time, which is Turner Hall. Nice, 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 nice. So that's why I won't be here. I need to recover. <laughs> no, I, I hear you. I hear you. I'll be going from Wisconsin to Philly to Jersey, back to Wisconsin, back to home. So I hear you, and, and absolutely, that's one of those things where – you beat yourself up at the bottom of the pool and you got to recover, man. You just have to. Definitely do. It's just but I will definitely it listen and tune in and can't wait to hear what these fans have to say. Yeah, no, it's it's all positive. It's all good stuff, you know. It, it uh I'm I should put together a little uh a little care package of of emails for you to read. I've been, <laughs> all right. I've been saving them. Um yeah, no, it's all good. A lot of people uh, enjoy hearing you on the show. They love the chemistry. They love uh, they love hearing from you, and they're quite surprised. I don't know why they're quite surprised at, at your because <laughs> I'm not just seeing you going eh, beer, mm, beer, wrestle, beer, <laughs> that's, beer, wrestle. That's that's what it is. That's what it is. Um, but uh, yeah, so we're uh, we're looking forward to your emails. We want to hear from you, uh, Tim at DarknessRadio.com. Uh, again, get your paranormal experiences in here, or just you know shoot Bruiser a note too. Um, we're gonna we're gonna have to get Bruiser a Darkness Radio email too. Yeah, yeah. Well, they can reach out to me. Yeah, exactly. Uh, if people want to, if people want to reach out to you by email, how do they do that? I'm on Twitter. It's at BCB Winchester. On Facebook, it's the Beer City Bruiser. Instagram is Beer City Bruiser, and they can just message me on any of those platforms and. I get right back to them. I've already talked to some people about alien abduction stuff and ghost stuff. And uh, they just actually someone tagged me in a thing um, here in Wisconsin. They just released a local brewery, released the Beast of Bray Road beer. Oh, so I am on the lookout for it. I want to see what it, what it tastes like. The artwork, I'll have to send you the artwork. It's amazing. Oh, I saw it on your Twitter. Yeah. 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 Yep. It's amazing artwork. So I hope it tastes good, too. Yeah. Oh, most definitely. That's one of those things that uh, we'll have to contact Linda about. Yeah. 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 Uh, but yeah, so uh, I guess we should wrap it up. So uh, for uh, Beer City Bruiser, I'm Tim Dennis. We'll uh, see you next week. And tomorrow, oh, oh we got to tell you about tomorrow. Tomorrow, we've got John Russell on the program. Uh, oh. Psychic yes. medium author. Uh, motorcycle enthusiast. He jumps on his bike. He's rolling around the country. And not only has he had uh, prominent uh, spirit experiences, Bruiser, he also was part of a pilot that never got to air about uh, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln and had some interesting experiences and found out some interesting facts about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln that were not known uh, before he and these are historical facts yeah. that he corroborated through psychic research uh, all right so we we come up with that on tomorrow's program also had some interesting ufo experiences as well did he yeah man you find the best guests oh <laughs> uh, you know i try uh so uh so john russell's on the program tomorrow that's tomorrow right here on the best in paranormal podcasting thank you very much folks for listening you're in tune to darkness right now.